So I'll start with a very brief overview of housekeeping in today's Teams call, which most people are familiar with by now. So um, please just use the, the chat function, and some people may have discovered that already, to engage with each other and with the speakers. So if you haven't already, go ahead and introduce yourselves there in the chat function and raise any questions that you have during the speakers' presentations, and those will be picked up. So um, to do that, you just need to click on the speech bubble to open up the chat. And then if you want to close it down, there should be a little X in the top right corner so that you can minimize it again. So we'll be monitoring the chat box throughout the session and we'll be pulling out questions for our speakers. So please do make sure that you engage there. Um, just to let you know that your cameras and your speakers are going to be automatically switched off, but they can be switched back on again if you want to contribute to the question and answer sessions. Um, so when that happens, though, you will need to switch on manually your camera as well. And finally, please remember at the end of the session to click the leave button at the end. Sometimes uh, we forget and leave them on and um, stay in these uh, seminars and this is recorded. So. Um, just to let everybody know that the webinar is being recorded and that's for the purposes of people who are unable to join us just during the session. They can listen again and we'll be sending that link out to you afterwards. So next slide, please. So this is, as I said, the 10th in our resilience webinar series, um, which we develop and deliver alongside our colleagues in Scottish Government, the Royal College of GPs and NES. And the aim of the sessions is to connect with each other, to reflect our learning and to share ideas that support primary care. And the topics of the sessions are chosen by you. And it's quite topical, I think, during the week of COP27 and at a time of rising energy costs that we're all very aware of, that our topic of the day today is greener primary care services. And I think there's a huge interest in this, despite all the priorities and conflicting um, priorities out there, that there is a massive interest in, in climate change and what we can do to make an impact there. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michelle Watts, who's going to introduce and chair our first part of the session. Thanks, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to see so many of you managing to make the time today. Um, I was going to start by showing you a wee picture of me on my e-bike um, to get us started off for today, but uh, um, I thought it was better just maybe tell you about it. It's not a very flattering picture, but um, yeah, just to say I signed off on my uh, paperwork for my e-bike today. Absolutely love it. Anybody who's thinking about getting one, um, please do consider it because you know, if I can manage it, then absolutely anybody. Began. Um, but a huge welcome to today's uh, session. We've got some fantastic speakers lined up and you know, just thinking about the timing of all of this, what a, a great opportunity in the week of, of COP27. And you know, the irony wasn't lost on me uh, as I logged in today and thinking about all those uh, you know, people on their planes and trains and you know, various mechanisms to get them to uh, meetings where they're all sitting about probably creating lots of uh, hot air. And here we are um, having a green, clean, energy efficient uh, you know, opportunity to, to come together and, and share some learning around greener primary care services. Um, so one up for us, I think. Um, we've got a chat bar, which, as you know, if any of you have joined these uh, sessions before, is a pretty lively uh, thing. I'm really, really hoping you please post questions, comments, issues, anything uh, on the chat bar. We'll be filling it in with links and um, your uh, connections into to more information as we go through today as well. Um, and the other thing is, you know, anything that you're doing, you know, what, what small thing are you you doing at home or in the workplace that you know just contributes towards um, that little bit of, of greener primary care services. So please post in, and um, you know even the smallest things can can make a, a huge difference. Um, I've also started knitting again. So anybody needs a blanket for their knees when they're on Teams calls every day, then please just give me a shout. It's not very good, worse than my biking actually. But anyway, here we go. And um, so. 
first speaker today I'm going to introduce is Katie McCafferty, one of my colleagues in Scottish Government, um, who's been doing a lot of work to support policy development uh, around green issues. And then she's going to be followed by Dr Munro Stewart, um, who's a Dundee GP, uh, who's also been working within NHS Tayside on greener practice and also does some work with the College around climate and sustainability. Some fantastic presentations and um, without further ado, I'm going to hand on to Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for that for that lovely introduction. That was that was that was very was very good kind of you to intro introduce me. Um, Hello there. Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to come along today. So my name is Katie McCafferty and I'm a senior policy manager working in the primary care division of the Scottish Government. Um, I joined the team fairly recently at the start of 2022, having previously worked within the Climate Change Directorate in the Scottish Government. Um, today, I'm hoping to use this session to highlight some of the existing programmes of support that are in place for businesses and also where people can go to act can go to access for, for tools and information which can help people begin their journey to better energy and cost savings. So but before I go into some of these details, I thought it would be useful for me to set out the targets which underpin these programs. So back in 2019, which and <laughs> certainly it seems like quite a long time ago now, um, the First Minister declared that Scotland was in a global climate emergency. And in that same year, she pledged to speed up efforts to lower carbon emissions with a view to reaching an overall target of net zero by 2045. So this target is actually underpinned by legislation which was enacted in the same year and that set interim targets of lowering emissions by 75% in 2030 and then 90% by 2040. So I'm sure you'll, you'll agree these are bold and ambitious targets, but there are already a number of several or, or several um, public sector organisations which are taking steps to reach net zero. So probably most relevant for yourselves will be NHS Scotland, which has already set a target to become net zero by 2040, which is a full five years ahead of the target set by legislation. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so I'll move on now to, to some of the support which is currently available. So there are existing programmes in place which are funded by both the Scottish Government and Transport Scotland. There are loans and grants available, as well as dedicated green champion events which are hosted by the Energy Saving Trust. We within Scottish Government, we have been exploring the possibility with EST or Energy Saving Trust, the possibility of dedicated events designed for general practice staff to get them up to speed on the cost savings uh, as well as the energy savings which can be made from, ad from adopting energy efficiency measures such as installation of solar panels, boiler replacement or indeed building ins insulation. We expect to be in a position to say more about this in the new year. Next, uh, next slide, please. Sorry, I'm conscious that there's lots and lots of comments in the chat box at the moment, so I'm <laughs> just trying to read both. <laughs> um, before I go into the detail of some of the measures which are currently available, I was interested to hear from yourselves and to gauge awareness of some of the most popular loans which are currently available to business. Um, so I've got a wee poll here, which if you would like to submit an answer, that would be fantastic in order to try and gauge the, uh, the level of knowledge that people have out there in terms of um, the support that's available at government level. I'll just give it a few seconds. Ah, 
I'm not sure if the results of the poll are through shortly. So no, so a lot of people don't have knowledge that they can actually take out an interest-free loan or 91%. So that's quite interesting from, from our perspective. So clearly an untapped market out there in terms of knowledge around some of the loans and grants that we currently have. So I'm, I make reference to the eight-year interest-free loan that's currently available for build uh, business improvements because that is possibly one of the more popular loans that's currently in place. Um, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So I'd like to highlight that many businesses are in, are able to approach the Energy Saving Trust who will then be able to provide them with a free assessment looking at the fabric of the building and its condition. Their advisors will then perform an analysis as to what a, what a business may wish to take forward in terms of improvements on a case by case basis. They will then direct businesses to the loans and grants which are currently available to them. I should say that all loans, etc., are subject to passing a series of checks. Um, for instance, it has to be uh, registered within Scotland. It has to have been operating for at least a year, among other conditions. I also would like to nod um, during the session that we also have a cashback cashback grant which is available up to the value of £30,000 for businesses and this is available on certain equipment such as biomass boilers, heat pumps among other items. Next slide please. So a number of you have obviously been chatting about transport in the chat and felt it was important to touch on transport as I know a number of general practice staff are liable to be undertaking home visits and will be interested in hearing about how those journeys can be undertaken in a greener way. So currently there's loan funding available up to the value of £30,000 interest free per business up to the value of £3,000 for e-bikes. Um, there's also funding available for e-cargo bikes and for adapted bikes, which is which can be accessed through the Energy Saving Trust. Um, as well as the e-bike loan, there is support currently for used electric vehicles. This is worth up to £30,000 and is available to businesses to cover the cost of a used electric car or van. And again, this similar to the e-bike loan is interest free. So, as I mentioned, both of these loans, both the e-bike and the electric lo car loan, are administered through the Energy Saving Trust with funding directly from Transport Scotland. I'll move on to touching on charging points, particularly as once, as I'm sure some of you are aware, once you have an, a plug-in vehicle, it will require access to a charge point. So again, Transport Scotland has grant funding available to help businesses install EV charging on their premises. And quite interestingly, when I was speaking to my contacts at Business Energy Scotland um, in the last week, they, they told me that the majority of businesses, when they get in touch with with uh, Business Energy Scotland, they tend to install 32 amp charge points, which can give a seven kilowatt charge, allowing most vehicles to fully charge overnight. Next slide, please. So here, so here you'll see I have included some links here to several of the programmes which are currently available and which I've discussed today. And I'm hoping that that gives you enough detail to get started on your journey. Thank you. I'll pass back. Hey, thanks, Katie. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Munro. Welcome, Munro. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got seven minutes here, so I'm going to focus on fairly big picture stuff and keep the pace quite high to cover a bit more material. So at the moment, we are all very much part of the problem in terms of harm caused to the climate and wider environment, impacting our patients' health now, but also our ability to provide future health care. 
my motivation for working in this field has been a mixture of wanting to have the biggest impact on health that I can, uh, a hefty dose of flight shame and ecological grief, and a realisation a few years ago that I was unhappy really because I was not living consistently with my values. Now I am a hypocrite and we all are, so my climate confession is that I drive a two litre 13 year old petrol car and I mention this because having a few people talking about how they're doing things perfectly isn't helpful. We need everyone accepting where they are and making imperfect and rapid progress. Now everyone here on this call will be at different stages on our journey that we will all have to make. So I've tried to pitch this as broadly as possible to be useful at people at all stages of this journey, um, including those who are, I'm sure, doing much more than I am. Next slide, please. So keeping it big picture, the relevance to us in primary care, I think there's four main angles here. The top left image, which you're probably familiar with, is looking at the determinants of health and environmental issues are the biggest threat to health this century. We're feeling the effects now and there is a growing risk to healthcare from extreme weather, infectious disease, there's projections of getting cholera in inland waters, more tick-borne disease throughout the year in Scotland, um, as well as global food supply issues, geopolitical instability, risks of war, migration. Top right there is the, is an, is the best image I can get for a breakdown of NHS's uh, carbon footprint, because the NHS or healthcare is responsible for about 5% of global emissions, and it's roughly the same in the UK, talking about carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. But there's other environmental harms which are pertinent now as well, such as air pollution. Um, in Tayside, where I work, the NHS is the biggest contributor to local traffic. And Mike Berners-Lee calculates that for every mile driven in a built up area, that three and a half minutes of life are lost due to the effects of air pollution. And we also need to consider the effects of water pollution from medicines, which you can learn much more about from Sharon Flieger's excellent talks on YouTube. Um, most of us on this call will be in the richest 10% of the global population. So we've also got individual responsibility for more than half of global emissions. But uh, coming back to our professional responsibility, the bottom left image is a chart of who the British public trusts to talk about climate issues. If you want to be able to read it and have a good look, then have a look at climateoutreach.org. We, so we've got a responsibility to speak up and lead the way on these environmental issues because they impact health, they widen inequalities and the public is looking to us to guide them. And bottom right there, really just to represent most excitingly, this, this topic is relevant because the action that we need to take to tackle climate issues offers us solutions to our biggest problems in healthcare and inequalities. Next slide, please. Now, the problem is that progress, although positively is accelerating, is still too slow at all levels. So what are the barriers? And the barriers tend to be people, particularly in healthcare, being pretty overwhelmed, not having enough time, not having the resources. Um, and also the things that hold people back are feelings of guilt or shame. So if you're thinking that you're already well beyond capacity, like most of us, then taking on the biggest problem that humanity has ever faced uh, might feel a bit overwhelming. So what I want to do is convince you of why engaging in this subject is in your interest now, not just in the future. And there are a number of organisations, as, as you've heard, such as the Royal College of GPs in Scotland, who are working in the way, working away in the background to try and make these changes as easy as possible for overstretched GPs and primary healthcare workers whose plates are very much full. Next slide, please. So talking about, you know, I think we have to talk about the barriers to, to change because it's it's fundamental to the whole problem here. Why are we not acting more quickly? And when it comes to framing of the problem, I would argue that we should be more motivated by the record floods in Pakistan or the droughts in China to, to rapid action than we are at the moment. But we still have inadequate behavioural change at all levels. I was hearing the other day at COP27, we're reducing emissions by one to two percent a year. It needs to be five to eight percent a year, something like that. Now, what the evidence clearly tells us about changing behaviour is that other than the law and the financial motivators, which we've heard a bit about there, we need to focus on the emotional and individual stories. So I'm going to remind you of Ella Adu Kissy Debra, who died because of air pollution in London. Because this might help us better realise how our actions are, are harming our children's and patients' lungs and encourage change throughout the NHS systems, which can then encourage wider change. 
So we are motivated by what's local, what's short term. Um, so relating that back to Tayside, where I work, um, we know that the yeah Tayside is the biggest contributor to health to air pollution locally. Um, and finally, in terms of framing the problem, the evidence tells us we need to focus on the opportunities and the positive side of things. Um, so I'm going to focus on the, how on, on that for the integration with practice. I mean, we, we do need to be honest about the stark nature of these crises, but doom saying and individual shaming alone doesn't really motivate people. And the evidence shows us that a ratio of roughly one part negative to three parts positive is, is a useful rule of thumb when communicating climate issues if you actually want to change behaviour. And there's lots of positives such as uh, improved health, improved efficiency, saving money, solutions to our current problems of overwhelming demand. So next slide, please. So how do we integrate this through practice? Well, de-prescribing to improve health is probably the number one thing here and, and realistic medicine. Um, and we could do, the reason for that is medicines and prescribing is about two thirds of our carbon footprint. So we need to measure and, and work out where to focus our efforts. And the biggest contributor within primary care is inhalers, which you're going to hear about later in a bit more detail. But let's talk about another few of the big ones. And these are picked because they are our biggest, uh, the biggest parts of our carbon footprint um, as, a, as citizens as well. So diet, the planetary diet here, which is, uh, cons is consistent with the best diet for humans. So in other words, we know that a more sustainable diet is a more healthy diet. And it's roughly a quarter of a UK citizen's carbon footprint. The picture there is from the Lancet Eat diet, which is very similar to the Canadian diet guidelines, which I believe are better and more up to date than our own Eat Well guide, which I think is a bit out of date now, really. So when I give dietary advice, I'm, and I'm having great results focusing on all the wonderful foods we could have people eating more of, I can be confident that I'm doing what's best for the patient and for the planet. And uh, yeah, our Scottish diet has a long way to go to being either healthy or sustainable. Now, the bicycle there is to represent active travel because we know that uh, exercise is the closest thing to a silver bullet. So while re reducing air pollution as well, you can see why myself, Michelle and a growing number are using e-bikes for their commutes and home visits and also encouraging patients to do so and doing some advocacy work about trying to get more safe, active travel. Next slide, please. Fuel poverty is a big worry, especially with cost of living this, this year, for the health impacts, but also the impact on general practice. We know that um, for every degree below five external temperature, it's been shown that GP presentations increased by 19%. So it's worth knowing what local resources and services there are for people and using your social prescriber or community link worker if you have one, this could be really key. Uh, and finally, finally there, access to green and blue space has been shown to be a really solid uh, option to avoid medication, improve health, particularly mental health, sleep, and uh, also concentration, which is useful if you're getting as many ADHD presentations as I am. Um, shown to improve the immune system as well, great for pandemics. Um, but connection with nature is also strongly associated with improved social cohesion, which is something we're in, uh, in short supply of. So next slide, please. So in summary, and I've gone very big picture here, if you're wanting more specifics of things you can do, here are probably the best resources. So we've got greener practice because it really does help if you find a team to work with on this in your wherever you're working um, or in your area and there's, there's great resources and great networks through greener practice. Top right is sea sustainability which can guide you through getting your building down to, to net zero. The Centre for Sustainable Healthcare has great educational resources and courses and the Green Impact for Health Toolkit through the college can walk you through what to do in your building and it, it could be used by any workplace not just a general practice surgery. So my practice has taken quite a few steps we're saving money from things like reduced paper, ink, petrol, energy bills. I'm happier for the work I've been doing. Um, and, you know, I mentioned at the start, we're all part of the problem, but it's really great to start feeling like you're part of the solution too. Um, and most importantly, my patients are healthier for, for changing how I work as well. Thank you very much.
Fantastic, Manu. Thank you to both you and Katie. Um, some really thought-provoking things there and lots of information posted up on the, the chat bar there as well. Um, there's some kind of common themes emerging, I guess, and, and the importance of recognising that it's it's no one big bang thing, it's just lots of small things. Um, the importance of changing our behaviour and thinking about even things like a healthier diet and, and actually considering next time you're in the shops, do you really need those raspberries from Morocco? Or is it better to wait and get them from Blair Gowdy when it's the summertime? And um, you're thinking about air miles and um, thinking about cost and affordability for many families. And um, you know, where cost of living is, is an increasing challenge. Um, a lot in the chat bar there about transport and um, you know, how we could do more about it. And it's not just about e-bikes and charging points. It's actually about helping people to get from A to B. And I just wonder actually um, how many of you uh, have recognised the impact of things like free bus travel for under 21s and um, for example and um, how much of the, the the kind of parent taxis has that reduced in the last few months and and I just uh, be interested in your comments on that and um, also some comments around actually how can we increase electronic prescribing and opportunities for video and near me consultations and cut down on those miles as well and um, fantastic to see and um, particularly from Kate whose fingers must be tired of typing some fantastic uh, ideas around um, surgery charge points shelter belts wiring equipment in and um, thinking about insulation 19 degrees as your default sensors waste management and um, loads of different different things there and um, yes uh, councils and local authorities can get grants to be, get uh, charging points in with posted some information in the chat bar there. Um, but I guess one of the big areas really is how can we put pressures on the health board? Because I suspect many of you are sitting in drafty, old, not really fit for purpose surgeries where it doesn't matter what you do. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a, a difficult challenge. So how do you get to your sustainability ch uh, champions in your boards and how can you change the behaviour of your boards, never mind anybody else? And I'm just going to leave you with a, a question mark. Um, who, who are your champions in your local communities that you can connect in to make that argument to the board that makes it so easy for them to say yes and invest in supporting primary care premises and, and development uh, going forward into the future. Um, so lots to think about, um, but we're going to move on to the next part of our uh, session today and over to you, Scott. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Scott Jameson. I'm a GP up in Kirimir and I sit on the RCGP Scottish Council. RCGP continue to be really proud to support this um, and as Monroe uh, capably um, uh, held there, um, it's a really, really critical issue for, for general practice and the RCGP continues to be very active. It's one of the priorities for the current chairs um, about improving our greener practice uh, in Scotland. Um, and my job this afternoon is to introduce a couple more speakers or th three more speakers we've got this afternoon. Um, and it's great to see everyone on, on here today. Um, and we're going to look at more practical ways within practices to, to help um, implementing green initiatives in primary care, um, um, both in practices and, 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 and in other practice uh, primary care settings. Um, green, green initiatives are not the behest of, of the GP, the consultant, the lead, the service manager, they're, they're everyone's responsibility as Monroe and the, the other previous speakers uh, alluded to so well. Um, and it was great to he, hear um, from, from Katie all the initiatives that are available to practices uh, and to other businesses to, to improve. And it's about how you put those into action. In my practice, um, our, our green um, champion um, who runs our, our e-health, e-green e e toolkit um, improvement stuff, is actually Geraldine uh, Wilmshurst, our healthcare assistant. Um, she is the champion and she's the reason that I've got um, you know, uh, recycled paper and we've got recycled pens and um, we, we've got LED lights in the practice and all these other things that she's worked so hard to, to get uh, championed recycling bins at the back behind me. Um, so it's been great uh, to do that and it's everyone's responsibility to be part of that. And it's great to be able to introduce this afternoon, um, uh, Peter Cosson and Sandra uh, Cahill who are, are from the Garscadden um, Burn Medical Practice in in Drumchapel. Um, I think um, um, one of your colleagues is doing a, a fellowship potentially that I 
um, um, uh, did last year, actually, the Colton Safety Fellowship, I'm pretty sure, um, when I spotted the name there. Um, but it's great to have Peter um, and his uh, and the pharmacist from, from there for Sandra to talk about the great initiatives they've been doing there. Um, and obviously, um, in, in, in prescribing, no doubt, might be might be relevant. We'll then move on to Katie uh, Walter. Katie is um, uh, award winning, award winning colleague from um, up north in, in Highlands, um, as I recall, and uh, in, indeed the, the healthcare professional walking champion, as I recall. So what an accolade um, the, 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 to, to, to win such an, a prestigious award. Really, really pleased to have Katie because, um, you know, um, we're all trying our bit and the profile uh, and the example that um, Katie is no doubt leading in her area, it will be great to hear about the work that she's managed. And um, last, we're going to um, end with Mark Bezik. Um, Mark is the national lead for the NAMI system. Um, NAMI is um, still really popular and um, it's got a role to be, be offered, I think. Uh, we use it a lot in out of hours in, in Tayside. Um, I say a lot, we've we'll probably managed not huge numbers, maybe 70 or 80 um, calls uh, every month we do on Near Me, but it's great to avoid people having to commute who don't need to come down to see us. And it gives you that eyes on. Um, and Mark is going to talk a bit about Near Me and how it continues. Um, it's a pre-recorded session for Mark, um, so um, we'll, we'll be hitting play on that when it comes. I'll hand straight over to Peter and Sandra. Thanks so much and uh, looking forward to your questions. Please pop questions into the chat and we will try and keep up with them. Thank you. Hi there, folks. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Hi, so this is a picture of Drum Chapel where I'm a GP, um, one of the many green spaces in the front. We have Canadian Goldenrod and Himalayan Balsam, who are some of the more beautiful uh, immigrant residents of Drum Chapel. Next slide, please. This is a quote to the NHS sustainability strategy that the propellant and metered dose inhalers dispensed to Scotland is more than the emissions from the NHS fleet and waste combined. I'll just give a minute just to absorb that paragraph while we go on to the next slide, please. So what does that mean by that 79,000 tonnes? I cannot imagine what that is, but that's more than a sixth, according to the sustainability strategy of the total building energy use emissions in the NHS Scotland. If we break that down into car journeys, um, one blue inhaler, a meter dose inhaler, is the equivalent of a drive from Glasgow to Inverness, which is a very beautiful drive, but damaging to the environment. So uh, inhalers, meter dose inhalers, the equivalent to two and a half million car journeys every year. Now that would be okay if the inhalers were saving people's lives, but can I have the next slide, please? So the UK does shamefully compared to Europe in terms of how we use our inhalers. We have a far greater use of inhalers overall. 70% um, of our inhaler use is short acting beta agonists, three times the emissions of most European countries. Go on to the next slide, please. And as we know, in fact, the use of short acting beta agonists is associated with increased risk of death because of poor asthma control. So not only are we hastening the demise of human beings tomorrow, we're also hastening the, the demise of our patients today through our poor respiratory management in Scotland. And so I've told myself if there's one thing I'm going to do with my career as a GP, it's going to be this. Next slide, please. So we have had a medical student who came and did a very short two week QI project in our practice. She came back six weeks later and contacted patients to find out what changes had been made. And in her two week QI project, she had done the equivalent of taking two cars off the road in Scotland forever. So this is a big impact, important thing that we can do and should do, not only for the future, but also to actually be responsible in our jobs as GPs. There are four elements to this. We're not gonna talk in detail about what it involves, but getting the diagnosis right, getting disease control right, getting the right device for patients, and really importantly, disposing of inhalers in a safe way that doesn't lead to leakage of the gases into the environment. Now, Sandra Cahill, who's our pharmacist in the practice, is our eco-cavalry who's leading the charge on this. So I'm going to hand over to Sandra now to talk about the practicalities of how we're doing these changes in our practice. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Peter. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so we've approached this as a practice team and um, we thought about, well, I've, we're going to talk about two kind of key messages here. So what we want, two of the key things we want to do is to make sure we're prescribing inhalers that patients actually can use. 
and secondly that patients know how to dispose of used inhalers sustainably. So we've approached this as a team, we had protected learning time for the whole team, we focused on these very useful respiratory uh, device guides that our respiratory MCN in Glasgow has produced. So this now has a choice of inhaler device at each step of the treatment ladder. It also gives information on the um, environmental impact of the inhaler, of each inhaler. Um, we, I had placebo devices, so everybody could become familiar with the different devices. Um, we discussed respiratory management. We put these posters in all the consulting rooms just for ease of access um, when people are prescribing. Um, so then we also discussed waste. And um, there's lots of inhalers out there that actually don't have dose counters on them. So the patient won't necessarily know when they've finished with their inhalers. These inhalers in general are the meter dose inhalers. So these are the inhalers with the kind of gas in them. In general, studies have shown that when patients discard these inhalers, 30% of the content of the inhaler is actually still remaining. Um, so the way to dispose of these inhalers in an environmentally friendly way is to actually return them to the pharmacy where they're incinerated. Um, the gas in these inhalers is hydrofluorocarbon, which is kind of a potent greenhouse gas. It's thousands of times more potent than carbon dioxide and hangs about in our atmosphere for about 270 years. So by returning these inhalers, which would still have some content in them um, to the pharmacy and they're incinerated, this gas will be um, uh, it'll be inactivated. Um, by putting these inhalers in your household waste, um, the gas will basically leach out and will hang around in our atmosphere and cause harm. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the next kind of key thing we need to do is to get these me messages out to our patients. Um, we've embedded these two key messages in all our um, respiratory reviews. So the clinicians and myself focus on inhaler device choice, inhaler technique, and also trying to ensure that patients know how to dispose of their inhalers. Um, what you find is that people really want to know how to dispose of their inhalers. A lot of people are frustrated by the lack of clear messaging. Um, people dismantle their inhalers and throw the individual or put the individual components of the inhaler in the recycling. However, they are actually not recycled. Um, one patient told me he takes the wee gas bit out of his inhaler and he puts it in a glass of water. If it floats, he considers that his inhaler is empty. If it doesn't float, he dries it and puts it back in his inhaler. There's another man who told me he scooshes out the gas from the inhaler until he feels it's empty. So really, we're, we, it's our duty to let people know what they can do. Um, we've tried also to take a proactive approach to this. We put together a leaflet um, so that patients, to give patients the information they need, and they can also approach us if they feel they'd like a review. Um, we've got a whiteboard in our waiting room where we put these key messages and we've also attached these uh, leaflets. We have a local community kind of peer support group that we've asked to look at our leaflets when we're developing it to try and get the right messages across. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Hello, next slide, please. Um, Have you got that there, Sandra? The enablers one, is that right? Can, yeah. Is it, the, can you put the next slide on? Sandra, I don't think you're seeing the slides. They are moving, oh, right. but you're okay. not seeing them. Okay, you're, okay. You're I don't on know you're on the community slide now. Oh, okay, that's great. Okay, so the next kind of key thing we need to do is to get the message out to the kind of wider community. Okay, great. 
Um, community pharmacy pay, plays a key role in this. Um, there's two key things here. We want to ensure that all the staff in the community pharmacy know why the inhalers are being returned to them, that there isn't recycling uh, facilities of inhalers generally available, but that um, actually incinerating these inhalers is the most environmentally friendly way of disposing of them. And we also want to, community pharmacies quite often order people's medicines. So it's very important that this is done kind of correctly, that patients are asked what medicines they need just to avoid kind of over ordering and extra waste. Um, so also we had wondered about having kind of local inhaler disposal points um, other than everybody necessarily needing to return the inhaler to the pharmacy. Um, this kind of gets the message out uh, that um, returning your inhaler to these disposal points is the most environmentally way of doing it and also gives patients choice as to where to return their inhaler. And um, we're also looking at our nursing homes, residential homes, how do they dispose of their inhalers? We're trying to make sure that they return them to the pharmacies also. Um, next slide, please. Um, okay, so the next slide really is about the enablers. Um, so we've taken a team approach to this. Um, we've had protected time to um, discuss the key messages and that gives everybody maybe the opportunity to become confident in delivering them. Um, we've involved healthcare students, as Peter said, this has been useful for us, but it's also um, good for the next generation of healthcare professionals. Um, we've used the, our local respiratory MCN and secondary care resources. They have a lot of very useful resources. Um, we use non-prescribing solutions wherever possible. So smoking cessation, pulmonary rehab, weight management. Um, there's lots of, well, there are local and there's national greener um, practice WhatsApp groups. These are great to um, become part of. There's lots of discussion, support, ideas. Um, we've also listened to our patients. So I've mentioned our local um, community peer support group. Um, they had let us know that our focus on inhalers, that there was some chat that this was really linked to cost. Other, you know, that was our main focus. So we really wanted to get, we want to get the message out that this is really not got anything to do with cost. It's really more to do with the environment. Um, and we looked at our leaflet that we produced and just using terms like eco and um, to try and get that message across. Um, so I'll hand back over to Peter now. Thanks very much. Next slide. So I appreciate that we've run out of time because of some of the technical lags. Um, just in terms of barriers, I just want to really emphasize that this has to be supported from the top. Practices can make a difference on the ground, but we want to have the Scottish Government and NHS boards make this their priority. So I'll stop there. There's a final slide with links and resources, um, but that will be available in the chat. So thanks very much and sorry for the technical issues that led us to run over time. I think it's now over to me, Katie Walter. Hello. Um, I guess it's a very full programme, so I'll try and be as quick as possible. Um, I've been asked to talk about introducing e-bikes into practices. Um, it was a range, one of a range of a number of projects that we undertook at Ken Medical Practice, where I used to work until recently. Um, we have been involved in quite a few other projects. Probably the other big one that we've been involved in is setting up an active health link worker service to try and get patients to ditch the car. But that's another story. So I'm going to concentrate on the practice. Next slide. Um, uh, so what was the problem? Well, um, within all the Inverness practices where I used to work, the dominant culture was really about driving to work. Um, there was the expectation that you needed a car for home visits, the way our day was set up. Um, and doing a staff survey, there were quite a few things that came up around no bike racks, no showers, no lockers. Um, and that was the case for pretty much every other practice. There's one practice in Inverness that was a real front runners, Burnfield, they've been on their bikes for years as, as staffing and visits, but the majority of us weren't. And um, most staff journeys were under five miles. Next slide, please. So um, what we decided to do, um, uh, along with our 
uh, practice champion Mick Heath, who was quite a legend, who's one of our patients, um, who we nominated for uh, our practice cycling champion. Um, he took his role to heart and he said, why are you just thinking about these things for your practice? All the neighbouring practices in the same situation. Let's think why. Let's try and do something for everything. So on the back of that, we got a scheme set up to get um, some funding um, to Cycling Scotland and High Trans helped us to deliver that in terms of delivering bike sheds to all Inverness practices who were, wanted to participate. Next slide, please. Mick is a bit of a legend, so he didn't stop there. He went I was standing in a queue uh, in front of the, I think, somebody very high up in Cycling Scotland and said, oh, you give me some money, I can get healthcare professionals onto bikes, slightly winging it. Um, but he got his grant and with that money, he um, focused on some of the lower paid health and social care workers to try and see if he could find some people who are willing to pilot the idea. Um, this is Lorraine, who's a school nurse in a area of Inverness where there's high um, levels of social deprivation. Um, and she was one of our early champions of this, taking on her e-bike with a little trailer at the back that she put all her kit in. Um, and she was really delighted um, with the impact that she had um, and ended up doing quite a lot of miles on a daily basis rather than a car journey from one school to another. Next slide, please. So um, I said to Mick, well, you did that for low paid, for seven lower paid health and social care workers. Oi. If I got some money, could we use the same model and try and find some practices who would be willing to participate to just try it out on a kind of do it principle? Um, so we got some further grants in several tranches. The first one was from Cycling Scotland, then some further money from the MOVE Fund and NHS Highland, and then some further money from Cycling Scotland. And with that money, we um, basically approached all the other practices in the patch and said, would you like an e-bike? Um, and the yellow marks is probably most of where they are. So I think most Inverness practices who wanted one got one. Um, and then some rural practices as well. Some really great examples of how they're used also in rural areas. I'm now in Ollapool. I use it to do home visits all the time down the road. Um, the basic principle is very simple. We give you a bike that's a folding e-bike. And the purpose for that is that we wanted it to be available, not just for doctors, but for all staff within the practice to be able to borrow evening and weekends to try out an e-bike. And on the back of it, some staff actually ended up buying it. But it was important that, it was, that you could put it in a car. They're not very, it's not very easy to do so, but you can do it. They're also step through, so you can cycle with a skirt. Um, uh, and it came with a helmet, a bag and a rock. And the deal was that the practice just took responsibility from there onwards. We gave us support through, through a website with some disclaimer forms if you felt the need, but very much this is a low budget approach. Here's the bike, do what you want with it. Um, next slide, please. So we did some evaluation work. Um, thank you to all of the, you on the chat who, I know I've seen Andy there, Andy Vickerstaff's name, um, who filled out the forms for us um, for the for the funders, but um, we got a lot of feedback from different practices. We have over 20 bikes that are allocated across the patch. And I guess the, the learning is that not all practices use them in the same way. Um, there were some really great adopters, so a couple of practices in Inverness who use them um, a lot. Uh, for example, Fairfield and Southside Road use them a lot for um, GPs who are delivering sessions in either community hospital or going up to the prison or going um, to A&E to see the um, designated patient scheme patients use them a lot. Um, but uh, so a range of, of settings, a lot for home visits, NAN, CAN, um, uh, two standouts for that. Um, but also staff who just use them to nip to the shops in their lunch hour um, and to try them out. Um, and really, there was a lot of work around away awareness raising for patients as well. A lot of comments about, oh, doctor, what are you doing on a bike? Um, and actually, that change started to introduce cultural changes that it became acceptable to do home visits on a bicycle. And it then moved to us actually looking at our working day and changing our working day so that people didn't have to drive in. And on the back of that, we, we also um, got an e-car thorny issue in terms of e-car, no e-car, but I'll leave it at that. Next slide, please, and I think final slide. Um, so the tips that we learned, if you're doing it, it's just as easy to do it for a number of other places. So think of your cluster, think of your buddies, think of everybody else in your geographical patch. 
our grants. It was the same application to do it for several practices and put them into one. Find champions and people who are going to be early adopters and make them visible, normalise it. There is a lot of money out there. Katie's touched on that. And the main thing is make it fun. Um, I think it, um, Monroe really touched on this, that the more fun you make it, the more actually you feel like you're doing something good. And don't make any assumptions. Actually, there are some people who've never been a cyclist, you stick them on an e-bike, they love it. Lorraine's a great example of that. So that was a whistle-stop tour through e-bikes in the practice. Very happy to receive emails about that or the Active Health Link work. And I think I'm handing over to Mark's pre-recorded video. Hello, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. My name is Mark Beswick, I'm the National Lead for NIMI Networks here in Scotland. I'm going to be speaking to you about how NIMI can benefit the environment in the context of primary care. Sorry I can't be with you today. My colleague Rosie is going to be there to answer questions and participate in the discussions. She'll also be posting some links to some resources into the chat as we work our way through. We're always very keen to engage with people on social media, so there's a couple of Twitter handles on there. If you'd like to use those, that would be great. So just to give you a bit of background, uh, the NIMI team spent a lot of time with Health Improvement Scotland during mid-pandemic, making sure that primary care had uh, all the right uh, technical setup, training and service processes to make sure NIMI could be used by them successfully again underpinned by quality improvement and also in a kind of spirit of once for Scotland. So fast forward now to, to the present day and uh, here's some data about the NIMI use and environmental impact across the whole of Scotland for all appointments. Uh, so again there's 50 million patient miles not travelled um, by, by patients after using NIMI cords, which is what they tell us at their post-call surveys. And we haven't really begun to look at the, the, the savings in terms of time and expenses for clinicians in using near me as opposed to drive around the countryside and the impact that might have on their health and well-being. So we're going to just next spend a little bit of time looking at some data from England. Uh, Edge Health did a, a research study and published it in September 21. And again, they were able to identify you know, huge amounts of patient miles saved but also equate that to some greenhouse gas emissions that were also not emitted. So 14,200 tonnes. So from there we can work out that it takes about 5,300 miles to create one tonne of greenhouse gas emissions using their data. And we're going to use that a bit later on to do some illustrations of what that might translate to in Scotland. So in Scotland, we've recognised that domestic transport produces, like people just using their cars mostly, um, produces most of the greenhouse gases and over half of journeys are under five kilometres. So that you know, gives us an idea of these short journeys um, and you know, how close people live to their general practice surgeries. And it's, it's just that, it's that realistic figure that we can perhaps use as an illustration. So we're going to use that figure uh, a bit later on. So again, what will this look like in primary care? We've done some deep dive work with our high users of NIMI within primary care, and they've told us in these small to medium sized urban practices that of the monthly appointments, which are average about 1300, 30% of them uh, are by near me. So that's about 400 appointments a month. So if we look at, you know, a return journey within your local area could be, you know, two less than five kilometer journeys. For 400 appointments, that's 4,000 kilometres that potentially didn't have to be travelled within your local environment. If we take what Edge Health use, that produces up to half a tonne of emissions just in one month around that practice. So if you look at that over 12 months over the year, as an average, that's 5.6 tonnes of emissions that aren't produced around that practice in that local environment. And I suppose I have to ask, you know, what's the impact of those fewer emissions on the health and well-being of those local populations? And do we have a public health responsibility to offer near me as a choice to do our part in cutting harmful emissions? And again, what would that look like across the 900 plus practices that are across Scotland? What are the potential savings in emissions within your local uh, public health environment? So how have practices done this? Practices have told us that um, they have dedicated appointment slots. They, the, the role of the receptionist and admin team is really key in that conversation with people around what's going to be the best tool for you today 
in terms of phone, in person and near me and making sure that there's near me appointments available for people to choose on a scheduled manner uh, so that, that that can be a choice that's um, given. The other thing they've told us is that there's added value compared to using the phone and these are the highlights they identified getting a wider understanding of, it, of someone's home context on a mental health conversation on video, bringing carers in uh, to support that, that clinical decision making, looking at long-term conditions like diabetes, how do we manage those and how does video support that? And if a pharmacist is using a uh, video for medication reviews, patients can show you their prescription, they can show you the, the tablets or the bottles rather than trying to describe or spell them. Discussions around returning to work, Again, really, really helpful in a video call. And seeing children in a home environment often present quite a different picture than they do in the clinic. Elderly complex patients that could be finding it hard to travel, but also could be in a care home where, where coming in via video uh, in, is more convenient and will give a, a better indication of where they're at. And people can also show you the, the neurological kind of presentation, the difficult the ways they're moving. So these are all lend themselves to video uh, consultations. And I suppose the other piece thing I would look at is, you know, who else within the practice can utilise video as a tool to offer as a choice of people? Who out of the people uh, that are in the wider MDT within that practice can offer that? So basically, uh, in summary, with, with every near me call, there's an environmental benefit to be had. There's potential role for us as clinicians to offer near me as an option to reduce the impact of emissions on our local population, the people living around us that we're, we're serving and we're, we're wanting to help their health and well-being. There's some links out to our public website and our professional website there. You can contact us an email as well and we would love to continue the conversation in the discussion. So thank you very much for listening and cheerio. Um, thanks very much, Mark, um, and uh, thank you to uh, Rosie Cooper, um, Mark's colleague in the NAMI team, who I can see have been in avidly in the chat um, answering some of the questions. Um, and um, Michael, we've got two or three minutes left, and um, um, so just some some closing things to sum up from 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 my section here, and I'll hand back to April. Um, I think um, you know what the discussion um, and the attendance today has really showed as to how invigorated people are about this. Um, nobody has a single solution here. Um, um, we don't know exactly what to do the best way forward. And I think as individuals, we have responsibilities, but also within um, our partnerships and within our practices and within the settings that we work in, it's responsibility amongst us all to work out, well, how do we how do we make this better? And if you're going to have a sustainable and viable health service, it's got to be sustainable from an ecological perspective as well. It's just as important. Um, it's really, really critical. And today, we'll hopefully we've given you a flavour of some of the examples of the great work that goes around um, Scotland to try and, and innovate and progress and improve. Um, but it is an, it's an, a responsibility of us all um, to, to, to be part of that. And um, I'm really grateful for you all attending today. And I'll hand back over to April to have some closing remarks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Scott. Good. Um, so I've learned a lot today. I think there's been some great examples shared and I hope everybody else feels the same. It put me in mind, I think a few times of a quote that we sometimes use in quality improvement. And it's the think big, but start small. And if you've ever struggled like I have to hike up a Monroe or, or a Corbett or something like that, um, you know that sometimes the best thing to do is just to look at your feet and just to count those steps. Um, so I think that's a that's a takeaway for me, certainly from today's session. Um, so thanks everybody for tuning in and thank you especially to all our speakers and facilitators for their time. And a big thanks to the team who put the session together because I think we all know that what goes on behind the scenes to make sure all the technical bits are working is no mean feat. It takes a lot of planning in the background. And we would appreciate it if everybody could complete a little, a very short evaluation survey just to help us improve these sessions. As you know, we're keen to continuously improve. That's what we're all about. Uh, and just to let you know that we will be sending a follow up email that will include resources. So don't worry about all, all the things that have been in the chat today. That will be sent to you. So please keep an eye out for that in your inbox. And thanks again, everybody, and have a good rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>